that we would desire to see more of Jesus, that we would desire to know you more, Lord, and that, Lord, we would leave here knowing we've met with you, and, Lord, that we would leave here changed. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would bless our service this evening, bless each and every one that's here, those listening on the live stream, and, Lord, just that everything we do would just, just lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
132 in times like these.
things as believers, as Christians, is to have the Holy Spirit working through us and in us and in our lives. And so I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Acts chapter number 1, starting in verse 4. And, here, and, as, and it says in Acts 1, 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but she shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they, were therefore, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's pray for the service of you. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for... Lord, just all that you've done in the church and the school and everything, all the ministries this year, Lord, I credit you. Just give us a good evening, bless the message, give me the words to say, and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit, it's something that is talked about, but many times it's talked about in a past tense or in a uh, generic tense or in a, in, in, in a sense that it's something that happened before but can't happen now. But the truth of the matter is, is we can't really do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit in our Amen. lives. You think about all the things that that God promised and, and that Jesus Christ did and promised when he was on the earth. One of the greatest promises was that he would send a comforter to help us through our life as Christians. And what makes the Christian life so much different than the life of the unsaved or than the life of, of somebody who does, who does not know Jesus Christ is that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, helping us along, convicting us of sin, showing us what we should do, Things we should say, just helping us along. The Bible talks to him as as, as, uh, as someone coming alongside. The, word, the Greek word is paraclete, or somebody that would come alongside of and help. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. The question is whether we're going to tap into it or not. Many times we read these stories in the Book of Acts, and I, I was thinking about this the other day. Is we read them and we're like, that was awesome then. Man, thousands of people saved, people just coming into the Lord in droves, multiplying the numbers in the church. But the truth is, we have the same God on our side today. We just don't access Him as often as they used to. The, the, the day of Pentecost wasn't an accident. The, the, the blessings in the book of Acts weren't by accident. They came with prayer. They came with devotion, with trying the best they could to follow after God. I, I think of, of, of countries like like, like Cuba, like Iran, like China. And if you really study and look in the numbers, Christians are being converted there all the time. You just don't hear about it because the government's closed and they can't right, yeah. profess openly of the numbers. But God is sending revival to those countries where the gospel isn't even allowed. Because I feel like in those countries you almost have to rely on the Holy Spirit where as here we feel like we don't have to because of all the freedoms we enjoy. They have no choice. They have to you know, do everything they can because it's more urgent there because of the, the, the nature of the governments and all the things that goes on there. And so many times like, we get comfortable, we get you know, so just okay with where we're at that we don't, we don't access it. When God can do tremendous things if we just trusted him more, relied on him more, used the power that he gives us more. Because we're going to talk about it. When we try to do it ourselves, it's going to fall flat on its face. Amen. And it's not going to work. It's not going to be blessed. It's not going to be God honoring. Even if it is, you know, in human eyes successful, it doesn't honor the Lord because God knows that we're doing it in our own pride and in our own abilities. And so, looking at the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to first focus on the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that's the passage that we just read. Jesus Christ himself promised the, the presence of the Holy Spirit to us as believers. It's not just... Oh, this may happen. No, it is going to happen. It says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He promised the Holy Ghost to the believers. 
And if you read in the book of Acts, if we, if we had time, we'd read all the chapters and I'd show you. But the Holy Ghost didn't just go on the 12 apostles. It was all the people that were in the room at the time. And there's about 120 in there at the time. So it wasn't just the 12 apostles. It wasn't just, you know, the, the three inner circle, you know, Peter, James, and John. No, it was, it was everybody that was there. And the Holy Spirit has been promised. And first off, it was promised by the Savior himself, Jesus Christ. And we just read it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the first part of it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you look over in Ephesians chapter number 5, the Apostle Paul is speaking of, you know, worshiping as a believer. In the beginning in verse 16, it says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, speaking, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the being filled with the Spirit was not just an apostolic command. It was a command for all believers. And we have, we have that same access, we have that same ability, but many times in our own life, myself included, we don't, we don't ask for it, we don't, we don't long for it, we don't desire it with, with everything inside of us. And if we just, really, if we just focused on drawing ourselves closer to God, on being with God, meeting with God on an everyday basis, we'd have more access to the Holy Spirit each and every day of our lives. But there are, concerning the statistics, you think about the average Christian who will pray five, ten minutes a week, read his Bible a couple times a week, your average Christian may not even read the Bible. Well, if we're not reading the Bible, if we're not in his word, if we're not praying, if we're not meditating on those things, how are we then to expect to have the Holy Spirit filling us? We're filling ourselves with hours of television and news broadcasts and, and sports and all these other things that we, we enjoy. And those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but when they're taking the place of our relationship with God, they're then idols in our life that are hindering us from accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it's promised by the Savior, but it's possible for all believers. Look at the first word, the second word in that verse. It says, but ye shall receive power. That word ye is the you in the plural sense in the New Testament. So anytime you see ye, it's a plural verb. It's not, it's a plural noun. It's not just one person that's going to receive it. It's not just one specific person. It is all. We all have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. The question is whether we're tapping into it or not. The, there's a, there was, you know, somebody was preaching one time and it basically said the world has yet to see what God could do from one spirit called spirit filled man. Yeah. D.L. Moody's response to that was, by God's grace, I would, I'll be that man. And I'm sure he had moments and days where he struggled and failed. But there's estimates, you could look it up, people estimate between 500,000 and 1 million people on two different continents came to know Jesus Christ in the ministry of D.L. Moody. Why? He, did he have anything that we don't have? No. He had the Holy Spirit, and he chose to access him every single day of his life. And so it's possible for all believers, but why do we need the Holy Spirit? Why is it? Well, I think God, Jesus Christ tells us in the second half of verse 8, it's for the purpose of reaching the lost. There's a whole world of 8 billion people out there, half of whom have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. I'm sure another quarter or more have never heard the gospel presented to them in the full explanation that many of us that, that, that we have heard in here. And why is that? Well, because many times Christians, we, we fail to tell them, or we fail to show them, or we fail to do our responsibility to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason that we have given the Holy Spirit is to reach the lost. In the second half of verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Our, our command as Christians is to be witnesses. And look at that, and I want to focus on a word at this point. It says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not like, okay, I go out once a week and hand out ten tracts, I'm good. Well, that takes care of Jerusalem, but how about Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth? Are you helping to support missionaries? Are you giving to, to really forward the gospel around the world because the command is to do both and obviously we can't all be in all places at the same time but that's the reason why God gives us missionaries and God gives us other people that 
have the ability to and are called of God to spread the gospel on all continents of the earth, the question is, are we helping that move forward? God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be witnesses. You can't, wit you can't be a witness in your own strength, in your own power, in your own might, and expect it to be successful. You, 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 you need the Holy Spirit to, even if you're like, well, I'm a really gifted speaker. I'm someone that, you know, I know all the words. I'm able to get up there. I'm able to just say it, and it comes out really well. But the Holy Spirit still needs to work on their heart. Amen. Because if we go on our own strength and we're trying to do it and do it and do it, yeah, we might get people to profess Christ, but if they're not really being convicted of the Holy Spirit and, and pushed to change who they are and convert to Jesus Christ and accept his sacrifice and repent of their sins, then are we really seeing people converted to Jesus Christ? Or are we just seeing, you know, another tally in our Bible or another name that we can check off or another thing that we can say that we did? Because if we don't have the Holy Spirit, there's no, there's, there's no point in trying to reach the world because we can't do it. Eight billion is, like I said, a large number. It's a number that any one of us in our own strength can't do, but a supernatural God working in supernatural ways can do it. There was a, a preacher with the college I went to who gave this example. He said if one person were to win one person to the Lord this year and train that person to go out and do the same thing, and then the next year those two people were to go out and win two more and train them to do the same thing, and that kept repeating itself and duplicating itself, in the 35 years, the number of people saved and trained to go out and reach the world would be 8 billion. Amen. You think, well, it's not possible. It can't happen. It can. But it comes by doing what God has commanded us to do. Matthew chapter 28, a verse that we've probably heard many times, but I think it can always be rehearsed again because of the importance of it. In verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. See, the, the important thing in this verse, at least for, for me, is there's two things that are important. It says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. The next words are go. So our going is in the power of Jesus Christ. The second thing is, the, last, the very last part of the verse is, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus Christ, God, is with us wherever we go. He's with us so he can continue to give us the power, and continue to give us the power to do it, and continue to give us the power to do it. We just need to go. The other interesting thing about this verse is, if you look at verses 19 and 20, there are four, ver there are four words that we would usually categorize as verbs. There, you can, and, you, and you can circle them, underline them, just let's look at them for a minute. It says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations. So go teach, baptizing them, and then teaching them. The interesting thing about this is, the only word there that's actually a verb in the Greek is to teach. And that word teach literally means make disciples. The other verbs are part, the other words are participles. They're part of a participle phrase, each and every one of them. So the command is to go and to, to make disciples, to bring people to Jesus Christ. That's good. But we need to make disciples, people that will follow the commands of the Bible, people that will stay in church for 20, 30 years, people that will go out and win other people to the Lord and bring them into the church and to follow after the commands of God. Now, we can't control the number. It might, I don't know, Judson, it took him seven years in Burma to win one person to Jesus Christ and train him. It may take you some time. It may take, but we need to go. And we need to be telling people about Jesus Christ so that when that one person's ready, when that, people know, when that family's ready to say, okay, we, we really believe this, we need to get saved, then you're there to tell them and say, okay, now you're saved, here's the next step. You know, you get, you get in the Bible, you study out the Word of God, you disciple them, and you, you help them to grow their faith so that now they're faithfully attending church, and now you have a new family that's out there doing the same exact thing that you're doing, and now you've doubled your effort. It's not just you, it's you and somebody else. And then they're able to go out and do the same exact thing. Because if, let's just, let's just use the example, if you're the only person going out and you win somebody to Jesus Christ and don't train them how to win somebody else, 
You're going to go out and win somebody. Go out and win somebody. Go out and win somebody. That's all addition. If you teach somebody else how to do the same thing, now you can multiply the amount of people you get to see saved. So God gives us the power of the Holy Ghost to, to reach the lost. Book of Acts, ye shall receive power, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The promise of the Holy Spirit is promised, first of all, but second of all, we will look at the filling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter number 2. First off, first of all, I want to show you that it happened instantly. And when the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 1 was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty, or a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the, all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem with Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. First of all, it happened instantly. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit inside of you. And He's inside of you forever. Amen. It's there. The question from then on is, are you going to choose to let the Holy Spirit control you? From that point forward. And at this point, day of Pentecost, they got the Holy Spirit on them. And we're going to talk about what happened when they were completely filled with the Holy Ghost, the, the amazing things that God did. Because it, you're talking about 11 of the apostles ran away the moment Jesus was arrested. They were terrified. They couldn't speak of Jesus because they didn't want to be near him while he got arrested. They ran and hid. And the 12th was a man by the name of Peter. He stood there, he followed and then proceeded to deny him in front of everybody around him just a few hours later. And I'm sorry, the first number was 10. The 12th was the man that betrayed him and eventually went out and hanged himself. So these weren't some amazing speakers. They weren't, these weren't the most educated, the most well-versed. A couple of them were, but most of them, if you look, were fishermen. These were people that didn't get out there and speak in public. In fact, their job kept them by themselves for most of the day. And they did amazing things and it started with Acts 2, when the Holy Ghost filled them. I mean, I, I just, I think about the, the Gospels, and if we had time, we'd go through story after story. They fought for who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They sat there arguing about who was the strongest, who would serve him the longest. They, they sat there bickering and fighting, and all the while, Jesus is like, it's not about that. Humble yourselves, and, and, and focus on others, and focus on the ministry. They went out, and they did amazing things for God, and then they were talking about how great were the things that they did. They, didn't, they were focused. They really weren't selfless. They get to the woman at the well, and they just, they're just they running away to buy food while Jesus has an encounter with this woman and leads her to the Lord. They're not focused about other things there. And over and over again, while Jesus was trying to point them to these spiritual things, many times they were just elsewhere. But when the Holy Ghost filled them, everything changed. You're talking about people that ran away and hid, and all of them but John eventually would give their life for the same cause that they ran away from when Jesus was crucified. It happened instantly, and it changed them completely. And the truth is, it happened while they were praying. We're actually going to go back to John, not John, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. I don't know why I said John there. This is right after Jesus Christ has ascended. The very next verse after, they were, after he was ascended, they're looking, they're gazing into heaven. The angels tell them, Go back to Jerusalem, obey his commandments. He's going to come back in like manner. The promise is given. And it says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon, Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. What, 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 they were praying. You know, a, a hundred or so people were in there praying for the Holy Spirit. They're in there praying, seeking after God. And the last, the last phrase in verse 14 for me is one that's, that's so amazing, so awesome. It's, it says, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. 
See, the, the, Jesus Christ, you know, Mary and Joseph had children after Jesus Christ, after Mary had Jesus, but they didn't believe in Christ. His whole life they doubted him, they didn't believe in him. The Bible says they didn't believe until, until after his resurrection. But now they're in there praying for the Holy Ghost to come down. <clears throat> and a couple of them ended up writing books in the Bible that we would know as James and Jude both were written by, by family. And it just shows me that you have, you have newer converts, you have people that believe from the beginning, you got people from all backgrounds, all over the place, just praying for the Holy Ghost to come down on them. And when Acts chapter 2, verse 1 hit, they were all filled. And instantly, they're able to be, they're able to do these things that they were not able to do before because the Holy Spirit was upon them. Thirdly, let's look at the results of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to spend the most time on this. First off, they were able to communicate to all the people that were there. And let's look at verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In verse 5 it says, And there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. God gave the gift of tongues in the New Testament, and you know the, the sign gifts have ceased since then, but you see the reason why. There are people from nations all around the world that don't speak the same language. And you know what? God supernaturally gave those men through the Holy Ghost the ability to communicate to each and every person there the gospel message. For the purpose, once again, of seeing people saved, the Holy Ghost continues to give them power. And he gives them power to communicate to all in this passage. So that, you know, you didn't have to have, you know, half the people were able to hear and the other half left. No, they all got to hear the gospel message because... They had the power of the Holy Ghost. And that, that's an amazing result. And when you go in the power of the Holy Ghost, you may say, I am not, I am not very, you know, I can't think of the word right now, but <laughs> very, very, very able to communicate with other people, obviously. You know, I'm setting a good example of that here. But, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm not the most you know, fluent speaker, affluent speaker. Maybe I'm not able to get up there and draw crowds of 15 or 20,000. But you can talk to, maybe you can talk to one. You can just give, maybe you can just give the testimony of what happened to you. It's, it's a, sometimes the simplest stories that have the most tremendous impact. I think about some of the stories in the Bible. You have a lad who brings five loaves and two fishes to have for his lunch. And now he's been broadcast for generations and thousands of years around the world. Why? Because he just, he gave something simple. He did what he had. You know, the woman who gave the two mites when she had nothing else to give. And we're still talking about her. The, you know, when Mary broke the spider and anointed Jesus Christ, he said that story would be proclaimed throughout the whole world. It's not the great and mighty things that God uses. Many times it's the simple things that God uses, and he uses it so that he can get the glory. Amen. When God, when somebody's full of themselves, they can't be filled with the Spirit. Amen. I was going to bring, you know, a cup up here and do a demonstration, but I want to spill it all over the pulpit and everything. So, but you can imagine a cup being filled of every, you know, of of all these other things, if you went to pour water in that cup, the water would spill out and it wouldn't be in the cup. If we're to be filled with the Spirit, we must be empty of ourselves. Because the truth is, you fill up with pride and with selfishness and with all these other things. The Holy Spirit's like, I, I can't use that. He's all about himself. But if you choose to empty yourself and say, you know what, God, I can't do this alone. I absolutely need you. He can do tremendous things. He gave them the ability to communicate to thousands of people that never would have been able to hear had he not given them that ability. I mean, think about that time. The gospel had really just been contained to Jerusalem. You know, Jesus Christ grew up, was born, lived in a 60-mile area. It wasn't a very large area where he, where he traveled to. You know, maybe, I think it was as far north as 90 miles and as far south, like east and west as like 30. He didn't go much further than that. So the gospel story at this point is pretty much contained to the nation of Israel and really Judea in that area because that's where the crucifixion and all those things happened. And we're not talking years after the crucifixion. This isn't even, it's been 40, 50 days. So you're talking about, you know, the first, you know, first century AD. This story is very much contained to Jerusalem. So these people that have come in, I mean, probably for Passover and other Jewish holidays, the feasts that had happened just a few weeks before, are now sitting there 
And this is their opportunity to hear the gospel because had they gone back home, they wouldn't have heard it. It would have been thousands of miles, maybe you know, thousands of miles away. They're saying they came from every nation on the earth. They've got to take that literally. As far as you know, the known world went at that point, that's how far they came from. And now they have this opportunity to communicate to them. They're not only able to communicate to all, they confound the people that are listening. Verse 7, they were all marveled and amazed. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cap Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome. Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one another, What meaneth this? Now they're asking, How is this happening? Isn't it amazing when the you know when the when the soul winning opportunity is brought to you? This is, this is what it is. They're like, how are we hearing these people in their own language? They can't speak that language. How are we doing this? What is the reason this is happening? It's a perfect opportunity for them. We're going to talk about it in a minute, how they took advantage of this. They're confounding the people listening because they don't know how it's possible. Well, I know how it's possible. You know how it's possible. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. And now God is giving them supernatural ability to communicate the gospel to people from three different continents. You think about Rome's in Europe. They're talking about Africa and Cyrene and, all, and areas all down in you know, north central Africa. And then as far you know, in, in Asia and, and, and far east over there as well. And all these people hear it in their own language from all over the world. And now there's an opportunity to witness. The next day we're able to speak with boldness. We just talked about it. Less than two months before they all ran away and hid. When Christ was resurrected, where were they? They were hiding in the upper room. Didn't know what to do next. They were frozen in their own place. They didn't know how they could possibly move on. Jesus Christ is now gone. What are we going to do? And then he appears unto them a couple of times. And then he talks to them, meets with them. And he's ascended. And now the Holy Spirit's here. And all of a sudden, what are they able to do? They're able to speak with boldness. Look at verse 14. But Peter. Yeah, the same Peter that denied Jesus Christ. The same Peter that sat there and went fishing because he thought he was unusable again. The same Peter that sat there and said, Lord, you know, you know I love you, that phileo love, but I, I, he wouldn't say I love you, the agape love, the sacrificial love. Now it's Peter, that same one, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. And I had time to read another 30 verses. He goes all the way through talking about how the Holy Ghost, how they were going to get power and how they were going to be able to speak. And then he gets to it in verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you, ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David, speaking concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast known, made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. What did he do? He's preaching the gospel to them. He's telling them what Jesus Christ did. He's telling them how he would be raised up the third day, how he didn't stay in the grave. And What is he giving them? He's telling them about the hope of eternity. He gets one shot to preach to all these people in their own language, and what is he giving them? The simple truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
When we go in the power of the Holy Ghost, He will give us those opportunities, those meetings. So many times, you know, and I, I, you hear stories of you know people just you know preaching the gospel to one, seeing them saved, and the impact it can have. You don't know what the impact could have could be. You just you just don't. There's a story of a man, a preacher who was on the, the ship the, the ship Titanic in 1912 when it went down. And he was floating and he saw a man a far ways off and he said, Do you know the Lord is your Savior? Are you saved? He, said, he hollered back, No. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. And they drifted apart after a while. All right. Came back together one more time. He said, Are you saved? He said, No. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The preacher, they eventually drifted apart again. The preacher sank and died in that water. But years later, that man who was drifting on that wood heard the story of this, of this preacher, I believe it was being given by one of his relatives who was there that night but survived. And he said, I was the guy you preached to. I was his last convert. I actually lived. I found a piece of wood, was able to float, and they were able, able to rescue me. And I was that preacher's last convert. He just, he took every opportunity now eternity was staring him in the face. He knew where he was going, but he didn't know where that guy was going. And what did he do? He took the opportunity to give him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that man's eternity was changed forever. And that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit allows us to do. It allows us to go with boldness. It allows us to go without fear, without hesitation. It allows us to, to do many great things for God. And lastly, it prompted a decision. The Holy Spirit's working in this meeting. Verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended to the heavens, but he saith by himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It's a decision. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Repent! And then after you repent, be baptized. Why? Because your sins, that's what that word for, that word for is a transition word, means for or because, because your sins have already been paid for. Amen. He, he, he gave them the gospel, he gave them this clear presentation, this clear message, and he says, repent, be baptized. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven, and you just have to now repent and confess them as Lord, and that's all you need to do. And so, what did he do? He prompted a decision. He gave them an opportunity to make a decision. And lastly, letter D, there was revival in Jerusalem. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day that were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So, what was, what was the revival? What happened during this revival? First off, there were people saved. 3,000 were added to them. Believers baptized. Church membership increased. All of these things happened. 3,000 souls were saved and they were added to the church. 3,000 people that didn't know Jesus Christ before. I would say that's a revival. Imagine if 3,000 people got saved in Ocean County in the next seven days. What would change about the area in which we live? How much things would be different? And that's not just 3,000 people saved. That's 3,000 people saved, baptized, and added to the church. They didn't wait. <laughs> there's, a, there's, no, there's no amount of time they're given. But the same day, we, we know it was the same day, they were saved, baptized, added to the church. That was, that was quick. They, they didn't hesitate in their obedience. You had people saved. You had believers baptized. Church membership was increased. Fellowship bonded them together. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done 
by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Think about that. They were together. They, had, they were unified. They, were, they came together. They fellowshiped together. The Bible says daily. They found reasons to come together daily to, to worship the Lord and pray and, and fellowship and you know, take part in, the, in, in, the, uh, in, in communion in the Lord's table. Why? Because they wanted to obey the commands of the Lord. The fellowship, breaking of bread. They did this all together. They, they would eat together. They did all of this, all of this together. All of this started because hundred and so people were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Next is sacrificial giving. Verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. The, 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 the church at Jerusalem, we're gonna, if you read the book of Acts, was heavily persecuted. Jerusalem was not just the headquarters for the first church, it was also headquarters for the Sanhedrin and the, the Jewish religious leaders. And if you read the book of Acts and you read the Bible, you know that they did not like Jesus very much. <laughs> they were the ones that really had him crucified. They were the ones that really were opposed to him. But it didn't matter if somebody came up with a need. Let's say you know they were being persecuted, so they were put out of their home. Somebody sold a possession, gave the money to them to help provide for them. They did what they could. They helped others. It's one of the awesome things I love when we do like others fund every month is that people that have have the ability to give to those that are in need. And it's not just the others fund. It's other, there's other ways too. You just you, you, you see a brother or sister has need. Many people, you know, people I I know you. you I know, I know a lot of people have given sacrificially. I know people have you know, helped me throughout the years. And all of that, why? It's not because of any other reason. It's because you, out of the gladness of your heart, have given to that. Well, what, that's, you know, that's not something natural. You know, I just want to write you know, a $1,000 check right now. <laughs> Nobody really wants to do that. Well, why do, you, why do people do it? It's through the Holy Ghost convicting us. Like, hey, you, know, you need to give to that missionary or those projects. I think of all the, over the years, so many times, you know, pastor... We'll mention a missionary project overseas. And it'd be like, we need this much amount. And you know, whether we're able to give it all or not, I know that some of that need has been met by us over the years. It doesn't matter what it is. And that's 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 living by the Holy Spirit. It's not it's not saying, well, this money's mine. First of all, you know, the Bible is very clear it's not. <laughs> God gives us the ability to work, gives us the ability to do those things. But it's treating things like they're gods and saying, okay, this is God's, this is God providing for me. So if I have a way to eat and eat, I'm going to do it. And this was what they did regularly. These people were not overly wealthy. You're going to hear later on in the, in the, path, in, in the Bible, in Antioch talks about giving to help the church of Jerusalem because they're in need. It wasn't, it wasn't that they were overflowing in money. It's that they saw a need and they said, I can help that by giving this, this amount. And they did. And why, why did they do that? Because they were living by the Holy Ghost. They weren't living in their own power, in their own strength. They, they weren't living by what they wanted to do. They were living by what God wanted them to do. And lastly, they had a joyful spirit and they praised God. And they, continuing daily in verse 46, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, to eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. They had a joyful spirit. They praised God. Now things weren't perfect. You read later on, there were some issues that they had to take care of. But their spirit was in the right place. And because their spirit was where it needed to be, they were able to really enjoy fellowship and praise with the Lord. And God can do tremendous things in our lives, in our church, in our community, if we'll have that same spirit together. That's the theme this year. It's together, and really, together as a church. If we're together, if we're unified for the cause of Jesus Christ, the impact that we can have. And you might be like, well, I don't know that I can go out and knock on 20, 30, 40 doors a week. I don't know that I can do that. I don't know if my health's good enough for that. Well, that's okay. Just keep tracks with you when you're at the grocery store or at the doctor's office or somewhere. You say, hey, look, you know, I, I know you're busy, but if you get a second, just read this. It tells you how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Or you can tell them, hey, this is good news from the Bible on how to go to heaven. Everyone wants to hear good news. 
There's so much bad news in the world. A little bit of good news doesn't hurt. And you're not, you're not telling a lie. You're not deceiving anybody. It is good news. It is how you get to heaven. Amen. And it's really, really simple. And, you, and, and, that, and that's one way you can do it. You can do it by talking to your neighbors, encouraging your neighbors. I, I had a, 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 somebody I knew, I can turn around, it was a couple of years ago, that was really good at like cooking and baking and doing different things. And they would just make stuff for their neighbors like all the time. Like, literally, they would just cook something. They, if they were baking, they'd just bake, and they'd give half of whatever they had to a couple of the neighbors, and they would give them the gospel, and they'd stick tracks in there. Listen, whatever you can do, God gives us all gifts and, and abilities that are different, because we all have, we're all, we're, we're all different people, and so God gives us different ways to fulfill the same command. He, he wouldn't make a command that we can't obey. Think about that. If God says, you have to fulfill, fulfill the Great Commission, you're like, but I can only... You know, if I walk from here, you know, from for five minutes, I'm you know I'm tired or I, I I have health struggles, so I can't do it. Well, the, the knocking on doors can't be the only way to fulfill the Great Commission, or everyone wouldn't be able to fulfill the Great Commission. So God will give you other ways to do it. You just need to ask Him. Say, Lord, I, I you know I can't I can't knock on doors anymore. I used to do it, but God, give me another way to share the gospel. I remember I think it was it was. Um, there's, there's plenty of stories of people who are saved, who are sick in hospitals, who are witnessing to the people in the hospitals, doing what they can. Why? Because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And at, 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 Ocean, at Ocean County Baptist Church, if we all get determined that we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, think of the impact that we can have. Those watching live stream, if you determine you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, whether you're here or in another state somewhere else, Think about the impact that you could have at your job site, in your neighborhood, in your community. In conclusion, God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We all have Him inside of us. The question is, are we going to live by the flesh or by the Spirit? According to John 15, without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. This isn't something that was just in the first century. We talked about it earlier. Theo Moody may have led as many as one million people to Jesus Christ through his evangelistic programs. You go to countries, closed countries around the world where the gospel is not able to be preached openly. They're experiencing revivals in house churches, in private meetings, in all these other areas. Why? Because they're filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. If we're filled with the Spirit, it has a tremendous power. The power of the Holy Spirit. Are we going to... Our power is very, very slim to none. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot we can do in our own power. Right. But if we live by the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can shake the world for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to preach, Lord. I thank you for... Um, your Holy Spirit, I thank you for the encouragement and the comfort that he gives. Lord, I pray that as we go through life, Lord, that we would be filled with your Holy Spirit, and we would access the power that your Holy Spirit provides, Lord. I pray that you help us to apply this to our lives this week, Lord. Give us a good rest of the night and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
couple of quick reminders. Don't forget, please sign up uh, next Sunday night after the evening service. We're going to have a time of fellowship and uh, just wishing Mark and Terry well as they get ready to move. Um, we're going to miss them dearly, and we want to just take some time and uh, spend some time with them. We love them, and they've been a, a huge part of our church here, so we want to wish them well. So that's next Sunday night. We do need you to sign up, so please sign up. Um, I know there's not a force field on sign-up sheets. I know it's always hard to get people to sign up, but you, you can do it. Uh, we already have quite a few people signed up, so please sign up because it helps us. We need to know how many tables to set up, so that would be extremely helpful. Also, couples retreat. Uh, right now, I believe we only have two spots available. That's it. So after they fill up, we will not have any more spots available. So if you are still thinking about it, we do need you to talk to the office as soon as possible. If you're already signed up, we need your deposit, okay? Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, it's coming around, a couple of treats right around the corner. So please, if you have not paid your deposit, please contact the office this week and make sure you arrange to make that payment because uh, we do need to contact um, Bert Hand and let them know uh, and give them a deposit check. So um, thank you very much for being here. Let's pray and let's just ask for God's blessing as we for this. Lord, thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that we don't go out in our own strength and our own power, Lord, that we go out in the power of the Spirit of God. And Lord, we know that, Lord, in and of ourselves we can do nothing, but Lord, in the power of the Spirit, the things that we can accomplish are limitless. And so, Lord, we do pray that, uh, Lord, as we come across different folks this week, Lord, uh, Lord, give us the boldness, give us opportunities. Uh, Lord, whether it's just give them a track, or Lord, take some time, invite them to church, Lord, or just tell them about Jesus. I pray that you would give us opportunities. We pray that you would bless those opportunities. Bless those that we come in contact with, Lord, that someone would come to know you as their Savior. Lord, that we would see the importance, the value of just one. Lord, thank you for what you've done in our hearts, and we do pray that you bless us as we're dismissed this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you for being here today.